Uh, Tricia Driscoll. Um, Tricia is the director of the Center for Mediation and Collaborative uh, Collaborations in Rhode Island. Uh, she's also on the, the board of the Economic Progress Institute, uh, and she has her bachelor's degree in labor studies from Pennsylvania State University and a master in city planning from MIT. Uh, with her is Carolyn Mark, who is um, uh, who has worked in nonprofit uh, professional development for a number of years uh, and is also the former chair of the East Granite School Committee for, uh, I think, six years? Eight years. Eight years. And she's gotten a few of these uh, professional development credits along the way as well. Um, they're here to talk about uh, issues around how we can collaborate and uh, importantly, uh, issues that might divide school committees. So sometimes the conflicts are within the committee. Sometimes the conflict may be between the committee and and the administration. And sometimes the conflict is between the committee and the municipality. Uh, and that's not uncommon. The way we we elevate, if you saw the last presentation on budgets, you know that that frequently cities and towns and school districts are loggerheads. Uh, along with the state over how much money they need to educate students. So this program is designed to identify, you know, some, some key issues around your, your personality, your profile, how you deal with uh, interrelations, and how you deal with conflict. And, and Carol, do you have anybody else that you have to, to introduce? Oh, I, no, no. no? Okay. I think we're good. All right. Well, Tim, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me and Tricia back here. Um, we've seen some of you before. Some of you were at the RIASC annual meeting back in May. Um, so some of the content that you see today uh, may be uh, familiar to you. Of course, if you were a school committee member serving back in May, uh, School Committee 101 is probably familiar to you. Um, but I'm sure, I, I know that I personally came um, every time it was offered because you always pick up something else and it was always a nice opportunity to um, to be with newly elected members um, in a context where you didn't have to worry about open meetings and you felt like you could actually talk to one another. So, um, so again, thanks so much to Tim for having us back and thank you especially uh, for giving us the after lunch spot. That's always the coveted spot. Every workshop leader is just hoping that they get the after lunch slot. But I, my hope is that it's been an, an energizing day for you um, and that the next hour and a half with us will be energizing for you as well. Uh, as, uh, so j just a note about the title of the workshop, um, Working Together, Avoiding Conflicts Before They Start. Just a little spoiler alert, there's no avoiding conflicts. <laughs> that is just not a thing. Um, however, there are ways to prevent some conflicts from arising, and there are certainly strategies for um, helping to make sure that they don't escalate to a point where it really becomes counterproductive and you're not able to achieve the things that you want to be able to achieve on the committee. So a uh, little bit of a misnomer before we start, uh, but hopefully it, it got your attention because who doesn't want to avoid conflicts? Uh, especially for the newly elected, that's probably one of the areas that you're, you're most worried about. Um, Tim has already introduced us. Um, he, he gave my bio to Tricia, but that's okay. We, uh, we share a lot these days, so she can share my background. Makes too. me sound a lot better, a lot better. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. I appreciate all totally that education. Uh, but as Tim mentioned, I did serve on school committee in East Greenwich for eight years. I first ran in 2012 um, and served through 2020, or until 2020. I was chair of the school committee for six of those years, so from 2014, until I chose not to seek re-election um, in 2020. And I have to tell you that those eight years on school committee were some of the most rewarding years um, of my life. It was hard work, um, but I loved it. And it's interesting because when I first ran, I kind of identified as a conflict avoider, as somebody who really didn't relish having to be um, on, the, on the chopping block to be the, the, the source of a lot of people's angst and concerns. Uh, but I was really passionate about the schools. I had great ideas, I thought, about how to make them better. And, um, and I thought, well, conflict just comes with the territory. I'll deal with it. And what's really interesting is I actually came to love it. It's not the conflict part that I relished. But what I found was I was actually better than I thought I was going to be at navigating conflict. And I loved being in a position to be able to bring a group of diverse people who had disparate perspectives 
on just about everything and be able to bring them together and get us all moving in the same direction. I found that work to be incredibly rewarding. Um, and I think in a lot of ways throughout my whole life, I'd been a mediator informally in one way or another and kind of had never named that for myself, had never really figured that out. But when I was stepping off of school committee, I got really in intrigued with this idea that I could actually do mediation work um, in the community um, after school committee. There was, in fact, life after school committee. Um, and so that's when I reached out to the, the Center for Mediation and Collaboration of Rhode Island, uh, took the basic mediation training, and started on a path to actually doing this work professionally. And so now I'm mediating landlord-tenant disputes. I'm mediating uh, nonprofit workplace disputes. Um, I was hired as a contract mediator for RIDE for special education disputes. Um, and I have found now that rather than going reluctantly into conflict, um, I'm going uh, willingly, uh, but equipped now with a set of skills that I think perhaps I had some natural inclinations for, but hadn't quite really honed um, or named in, in some way. So um, the best part of this journey for me is getting to meet people like Trisha um, and, and the center. Um, I also serve on the board of the center, and so I want to give Trisha an opportunity to, um, to introduce yourself. Is that I can talk for the next hour and a half, so I know it's chilly in here, but no worries. I have a lot of hot air. It's going to warm right up. So those of you who are like bundled up, don't worry. You're going to be able to shed those coats very, very quickly. Uh, I want to I first of all say thank you for your service. Right? Um, it is a, a challenging role to take on in any community as a school committee member. Um, and I know there are lots of people who are very quick to let you know um, when they're not happy with what you're doing. Um, and just want to let you know that there are some people who really appreciate you all stepping up um, for our kids because that's kind of what it's all about, right? Um, I have, uh, we have two kids. They, they went through um, public schools here in Rhode Island. I went through public schools in Rhode Island. Um, didn't get to the master's degree that Carolyn has, but that's okay. I feel like I did all right. Um, one of the things that I love about my job is being able to come meet folks like you and help maybe in some small way help you um, really remember the skills that you have, right? Um, we're not going to teach you anything today that you probably don't already know. That, that's kind of a spoiler alert, but it's true. You know, most of us gain some sort of conflict resolution skills throughout our lives, whether that's on the playground, whether that's in your home, whether that's in your business, right? Most of us have, have come into conflict and have come out of it. Now, you might come out scathed, you might come out unscathed, but there are ways to do this where things are actually not as bad as you think going in. So one of the things that I love about talking about conflict resolution and talking about conflict maybe not as something to avoid, but maybe more as like a bridge, right? I like to think of conflict as a bridge to change. And it's a bridge that we all have to go over, right? Now you can go over by yourself if you want. It's kind of lonely and you're not really that, I don't know, it doesn't really work that well. But if you can bring some other people along with you and get to the other side, that's where the real magic happens, right? That's where the change that we're all looking for starts to happen. So today, one of the things that we're going to talk about is sort of where are you in your sort of conflict style? And those of us, as kind of, you know, those of us who were here last year, hopefully your style hasn't changed, but that'll be interesting to see. Um, we're going to, and we're going to talk a little bit about what it's like to know where you are and know where other people are and how that's going to help you to maybe navigate through some of the stuff that you're going to go through, whether that be with your fellow school committee members, whether that be with your municipality, or whether that be with, uh, with those of us in the community at large. So really excited that you're here today. Um, again, I'll temper my hot air depending on how that temperature goes. So don't worry, we'll keep it minimal and uh, we'll get going. There we go. So, um, so this is how we're gonna spend our time today. We're gonna talk a little bit about the current climate um, that you are all working in, what your current context is. We're gonna talk about roots of conflict, where they come from, what successful relationships can look like. You're gonna have an opportunity to take this personal conflict assessment and really start to think about some skills and strategies that you'll be able to use. Um, we'll also, it, it, this is really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what the center does and offers. We'll leave you with some resources at the end and hopefully there'll be opportunities to follow up because you know, I know not all of your colleagues are in the room and you might find this information would be particularly useful in your community and so we'll leave you with some, um, some information about what, uh, where, where you could go next with this, with this topic. Uh, but starting with the current climate, um, I don't need to tell you, it's been rough out there. The last few years, school committees have always been conflict-ridden places. I don't think we ever got enough credit as members for the kind of conflict that we have to deal with. There are certainly some um, elected officials at higher levels than school committee that will say to you, 
I never would have done school committee because they do recognize that there's a lot of conflict, but it's gotten really bad over the last few years uh, with the stressors that have been on us uh, on, on, as a society. Um, we shared back in May that about 25% of superintendents resigned in 2021 compared to a typical turnover rate of 15%. And a new statistic that we have that we didn't know back in May, but as of 2022, 38% of school committee members across the country um, planned on running for re-election, which was down from 55% in 2018. Now, some of you newly elected who have never served before, that might worry you a bit. But I have a feeling you knew what you were getting into. But it's gotten harder. It's just, it's gotten a lot harder. Um, and, the, and the problem is that there is so much work to do coming out of this pandemic. Please tell me we're coming out of this pandemic. We are together. We're not masked. I feel like we're making progress. There is so much work to do to address the learning loss that happened during this time. And the most important thing a school committee and a school district can do is focus its efforts and energies on making up for that learning loss and getting our students to where they need to be. Um, and conflict just has a way of getting in the way of the work that really needs to be done. So it's a problem. As I said, I don't need to tell you this, you're living it. And so what we want you to do is we want you to take just a few minutes on a piece of paper and I want you, we want you to jot down what are the top two to three most challenging or pressing conflicts that you are anticipating in the coming year or that you're currently mired in right now. Uh, we want you to know, focus on conflicts you're, conflicts you're currently experiencing or you're anticipating that are coming down the pike. Just two to three minutes on your own. And, and use a short piece of paper. I know you might you might be able to do you know I, I don't mean, write I know. a book. Some of you are working for the notebook. <laughs> just this is just a short exercise. I know I know. If you want to stay with your own committee members, you're welcome to. Mixing it up is good too. Uh, but if there's just two of you two of you at a table, find a table that's a little lean that's a little lean and join them. Um, and when you get together, um, decide who maybe would be willing to report out. We won't ask every group to because we don't have that kind of time. Uh, but we do want you to share with one another the current conflicts that you're experiencing or the ones that you anticipate, um, again, just in, in smaller groups. So we'll give you 10 minutes to have that conversation. All right, everyone. I'm going to ask you to bring it on in. So we're going to take about 10 minutes now because I want, I want us to have a chance to hear from each other about some of the kinds of conflicts that you are facing or expect to be facing in the coming year. So to give us a sense of what you've been talking about at all of your tables, we're just gonna kinda go popcorn style, but if there's somebody from your group who's willing to share uh, a conflict or a type of conflict that you've been talking about, um, we'd love to be able to have a group conversation. So who would like to get us started? We've got, we've got a hand up here in the back, and Trisha's going to bring a microphone around. Thank you for going first. It always takes a brave person. Thank Trisha, you so much. You're awesome. All right, if we could, I know, I know it's hard to stop talking about this stuff. It's, there's a lot. There's a lot. But let's, uh, let's try to give our colleagues our attention. Go ahead. Thank you and very much. And do introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sandra Blank. I am on the school committee in Portsmouth, Portsmouth, Rhode Island, actually. Yeah. Um, the topic we had brought up uh, was polarization of political hot topics mm -hmm. and how it affects the school committee decisions. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are quick to ignite and have, ha and have strong opinions without collecting all the facts. Thank you. And are you talking about amongst school committee members, between the school committee and members of the community? Yeah. In Who's the involved? In the community and mm -hmm. then that pressure and... Um, strong influence of the school committee has to react now and do something mm -hmm. um, without deal looking at all the facts first. And the, and the root causes would be these deeply held political beliefs or values that are driving the, just the, the conflict. Yeah. No, and just that strong, that quick to make a decision without looking at all the facts that is kind of across the board. Great. Thank you. Yep. Great, great example. Who would like to go next? Yes, right here? Thanks so much. No 
Do introduce yourself. Uh, Sean Galligan with the Warwick School Committee. Uh, one thing that was kind of common across our whole table was uh, the contract negotiations this year with our Warwick Teachers Union. Um, I would say that what's challenging for us is it's like a poker game. You don't know what they're holding. They don't know what we're holding. You don't know what their thoughts are. There's obviously language within their contract that we'd like to see changed. Um, and, you know, we don't know where they would stand on those changes. So certainly we might go into it a little bit stronger or uh, that was the big one for us. And what would you say are some of the root causes of the, of the potential conflict? Lack of communication. Just it's you don't know what they're thinking. Uh, they're trying to get what's best for their, their union members. And mm -hmm. we're trying to what's going to get what's best for the district and the students. So uh, I would say that's what it is, the communication. Great. Great, thank you. Thanks. Another great example. We've got a hand up over here Oops. and down here. Either way. Coming. Wherever Trisha gets first. <laughs> and then to the back. Anyway, I should have worn my Fitbit today. <laughs> Hi, Deb Polish, Tiverton. Um, this is unique to us, probably not to many of you. We just eliminated our financial town meeting, financial town referendum. So this will be the first year that our budget goes to our town council. So there are conflicts within the board on setting priorities, and there are conflicts with the council with setting priorities, which is new for us. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? You've got a lot of colleagues in this room that have been working with town councils for a long time. And they all <laughs> But you're now a part of a network of folks, and I hope you'll leverage those relationships in service to figuring it out. Um, I'm Kim Grant, and I'm from Pawtucket. And um, one of the challenges we see is um, superintendent. Um, we have a superintendent um, who was a non-renewal. Um, at this time, um, she is out on leave, medical leave. We have a, um, um, someone who has taken her place um, but we are going to eventually go out for a search and, you know, we feel that that's going to probably be a challenge. You don't think everybody's going to agree on what they're looking for in the next superintendent? Uh, exactly. <laughs> and, and I think, um, you know, there are other political factors that kind of, uh, people are very concerned that those factors might um, roll into it or get involved in it and that always ends up being very concerning. Great, thank you. Thank you for sharing that one. Good afternoon, my name's Tom Briety. I'm from North Kingstown, Rhode Island, newly elected, and uh, I've been drafted to present our table. So, uh, challenging conflicts. One thing, I, we have some colleagues from Lincoln here. They're very concerned about their budget and the structure of uh, the financial network that they have to navigate in order to resolve issues. Um, you may know about North Kingstown. We've made a lot of news recently. Uh, we, we, were, uh, we had a school superintendent and interim superintendent quit. Uh, it was an enormously difficult situation for us. Um, we are in the process of hiring a new superintendent, and the conflict is going to be between the committee and parents and teachers who are frightened and whose morale is, uh, is threatened. Um, we also have a new teacher's contract, so uh, sympathy is there. Uh, and we need to build some new buildings. And there are a lot of stakeholders that are involved in that. Uh, finally, we're dealing with uh, my colleague over here who talked about the politicization of the environment. We've seen that we've got lots of people on school committees that are saying they've had enough and they don't want to do this anymore. Um, I got involved in this because of the politicization. Uh, I know that a lot of other people have as well because there's a lot of tension out there. And uh, there are parents, I don't agree with many of their ideas, but they are feeling that they have not been heard and they are frustrated. So um, we're dealing with all that. So here we go. No rest for the weary, never a dull moment for sure. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a hand, we actually there's a hand back there oh. and a hand over here. Awesome. Oh, yeah. You really are going to get your steps in, Trisha. <laughs> Thanks so much. I kids say, oh, I was stretching. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Carolina Robert Santana, and we are Providence. Um, so Welcome, Providence. Thank you. Um, so we actually have um, four board members here. Um, three of us have not even been um, sworn in yet. 
so we have no clue what's happening. Um, and then we have a nine-year-old board member. N not nine years old. He's been on the board for nine years. All right, let me focus. Um, so in terms of conflict, we were just um, kind of talking about the need of this was probably my concern more than anything, but like having one voice as a school committee because there's four of us that are coming in new and five that are existent. Um, how do we make sure that um, our, the mission remains one, that we're all one voice, that we're collaborative, and that it doesn't become a new board versus old board type of um, situation um, so that we can do the best for what the mission is, is care for our kids. And so that's sort of like the main conversation that we had in our group. Yeah. Thank oh, you, everyone. That's great. Yeah, thank you. That was terrific. So um, I think, we, do we have time for one more? I think sure. we do. Sure. Um, so Trisha, like I said. I'm coming. <laughs> Here I come. Here I come. I know, <laughs> if I had a better arm, I would, but I'm afraid of hurting someone. I have a very loud voice. I have a teacher voice. <laughs> Teacher voice, here you go. I'll just amplify it a little bit. Hi, Teresa Spangler from Middletown. I've been on for over 20 years, so I've been doing this a really long time. Um, we have in our district some challenges. Of course, everybody has budget challenges and if, with the funding formula, lots of questions. But a new, uh, a big topic that has come up is, is special education. Um, it's, it's not new, but it's reoccurring. Now, of course, with COVID, we are dealing with, I'm sure everybody is, is the loss of learning trying to make up the difference for support services for students with the social emotional challenges, getting the, uh, the financing for student um, supports for guidance counselors, social workers, psychologists, and also the teams, you know, of, of OT, PT, and things like that. So it's very difficult with, uh, when you have special education, not only with students in the classrooms, but you also have the high-end special ed students. And of course, from McQuidnock Island, they have to go off island for uh, support services and then those costs get extremely high and then you present that to the town council and the council doesn't understand why are you spending hundred and twenty five thousand dollars on a student because With we a, have to because we have to and you have to provide transportation and you have to provide all the different supports so that's a really big challenge that um, you know is, is happening and not just in our district but I'm sure in all and the other thing is somebody else mentioned is buildings we need to redo buildings and it, that's a very difficult reimbursement process with the state. So. Right, great. Well, thank you everybody for sharing. I think that was a really great range of the kinds of conflicts that, um, that school committees deal with every single day in every community. And um, either, while there are some unique circumstances, there's really, we have a lot more in common than, than not. Um, I heard lots of different kinds of conflicts. I heard conflicts between and among school committee members and a desire to be able to, you know, be heard with one voice. Um, I've heard conflicts between school committees and superintendents, between school committees and the community, um, and concerns about the relationship between the school committee and the district and the bargaining units that represent, uh, whether it's teachers or custodials or support staff. Um, you've really kind of covered the gamut of the kinds of conflicts that I think you will, you do, and you will experience. Um, and it's hard when, there, when you are surrounded by so much conflict sometimes to step back and try to gain some perspective on it. Um, and, but believe it or not, there's actually some theory that comes with understanding conflict and where it comes from. And understanding that can really help to inform how you move forward individually, and also in terms of developing strategy as a school committee as well. The better that we can understand the sources of conflict, the better we are to be able to create strategies to address them. So Trish is gonna take over at this point. She's gonna kind of go through um, where does conflict come from and what can we do about it? Right, we're all in education, so we're gonna give you a little bit of theory because sometimes it's actually really important to understand where conflict comes from, and maybe what, what we see and what we don't see. So conflict essentially occurs along these three dimensions, cognitive, emotional, and behavioral, right? So it's perceptions, it's how you feel and how you act, right? Um, we'd like to think that as, as grown-ups, we're sort of in control of these, right? Um, I would suggest that maybe we're not always in control of these, right? So sometimes we know what we feel, we know what we think, and then we act completely different, right? So there's a, a, 
a really, really cool sort of theoretical piece called the conflict wheel. So I'm going to show this to you. And if you were here last year, you, you should be able to just whip this right off. So this is what we look at as the causes of conflict. So right in the center of this wheel is something called needs, right? Conflict comes because we need something. We need to be heard. We need food, clothing, shelter. We need to be understood. We need to get to school. We need to get to work. There's some need at the center of all conflict, okay? But then there are these different areas that conflict comes from. So I'm going to sort of start at the top right and swing around um, because I'm wearing trifocals and I can barely see it. So I'll try and read it out for those of you in the back. So in the light blue is something called a data conflict, right? So that's when you have a lack of information, misinformation, differing views on what data is important or not important, and differing interpretations of this data. Now, raise your hand if you feel like you've ever been in or seen a data conflict in your school committee time. Yeah. So this is a pretty popular one, right? Because there's lots of information out there, but how we interpret it, how we get it, where it comes from, is really important. Okay. So moving down, in the light green, interest conflicts. So these are perceived or actual conflicts over interests. They could be procedural interests or they could be psychological interests. So here's the tough thing about interests. You can't see them, right? So my interests, I hold on the inside unless I choose to share them with you, right? So keep that in mind as we move forward. Down at the bottom is probably one of the most important ones, and that's what we put as value conflicts. So these are different ways of life. This is ideology. This is political stuff. This is the values that we live by, right? And we have different criteria for evaluating ideas based on where your values are, right? So this is a tough one because if I think that you and I are in conflict because of my values, that's, it's, it's going to be real hard for you to convince me otherwise, right? If I really believe that my values are, quote, better than yours, it's going to be awfully hard for us to agree on things. Moving along, the next area of conflict is what we call structural conflicts. So this is all about authority, who has it and who doesn't and who should. Unequal control of resources, that may sound somewhat familiar. And time constraints, right? I have three minutes to express myself. I can't talk to you. We can't talk together because of a regulation that prohibits that, right? Time, very, very important. And the last one, we save for last. This is all about relationships. This is the emotional stuff. Miscommunications, strong emotions, um, emotions without information or, or with misinformation or a lack of information, stereotyping, and repeating negative behavior, repetition. Right? So emotions are probably the, one of the most important things when we think about conflict because conflict very rarely occurs in a neutral setting. Right? So think about conflict in your head. Think about conflict either with the school committee, think about it in your family, in your place of work. Is it calm? Is everyone just talking in a normal voice? No one's face is red? No one's getting antsy? No, it's just you're just chatting? No, that's not how conflict happens. Conflict gets ramped up because we get ramped up. It's a very physical thing. You can see when people are in conflict, can't you? You can hear it. Do people use soft voices when they're in conflict? No, they do not. <laughs> they use loud voices. They use a lot of body movements. Again, when I'm in conflict, my face gets red. Not now, because it's like 40 degrees, so that's great for me. But <laughs> okay? So <clears throat> that emotional piece is really, really important to us. Okay. <clears throat> Here's another really important concept around conflict theory. It's called positions versus interests. So these are little icebergs. I know, I'm not getting into climate change, but these are icebergs, okay? So on the top, the tiny little part is positions. So that's what you see. People's opinions, what they've stated to be their opinions, what their strategies are, what we tell you, what you are willing to share outwardly. I may or may not share my unstated opinion or experiences that I've had or assumptions that I'm making or biases that I have or my values. And what I'm probably not sharing are my needs. So I'm just going to stand here in my position and you and I are going to try and engage based on that tiny little piece that I've chosen to share when in fact we're missing a whole, you know, probably 70% of me you're missing because I'm not sharing that. Okay? So when we think about conflict and when you're looking at other people and you're trying to figure out 
how are we going to get through this conflict? I want you to think about that iceberg. <clears throat> because what that person is saying and what they're sharing with you may not be all there is. In fact, most of the time, it's not all there is, right? Have you ever come home from work um, in, a, in kind of a bad mood? Um, maybe something happened at work, you made a mistake, or someone yelled at you or something, and, and you kind of snap at the person who you see in your house, right? Is it, I mean, are you really snapping at them? No, you're snapping at what just happened at work, but they don't know that, right? This is a classic thing that happens every single day, right? I mean, it's not just me, right? Everyone, it happens, okay, 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 great. Right. I was, I was feeling a little bit nervous there for a minute. Um, but here's the thing. If you come home from work and say, oh my gosh, I had a really terrible day today. I made a mistake on something that I really shouldn't have, and oh gosh, I'm gonna need a few minutes to get myself together. Great, now everyone knows. So you've given that other person an opportunity to not be in conflict with you. So Trisha, I actually have a little story. I was hoping you would, Carolyn. But you haven't heard it before, so you have no oh, idea what I'm, I'm about to say. I'm gonna sit down. And here's the thing about this story. It's, it requires that I air a little bit of dirty laundry. It's literally about dirty laundry, okay. We're on so, video, Carolyn, I just wanna <laughs> remind you. So my husband and I, we've been married for about 30 years. It'll be 30 years this year. And um, we've always had a pretty equitable distribution of labor when it came to household chores. He, he's the cook in the family. How lucky am I, right? So he's the one who does all of the cooking. I do all of the laundry. I always felt like I got the better deal because, you know, you do laundry maybe once or twice a week, but you're cooking every single day. So I've, I've, I've always been perfectly fine with that. But here's the thing. For 28 years, my husband has had a habit of always putting his socks in the laundry, inside out. <laughs> and it has made me nuts for 28 years. I have silently seethed for 28 years, <laughs> but I don't want to start cooking, so I've just kind of kept it to myself. Well, I took some conflict resolution training, <laughs> and I thought, there's got to be a way to figure this out. So I decided to bring it up with my husband, and I said, honey, I really am so fine continuing to do the laundry, but I would really appreciate it if you could just turn your socks right side out. It would just make my life a whole lot easier. And I thought, you know, I'm making a request. I'm saying it nicely. I'm not getting mad at him. He's going to say, sure. He says, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> like, okay, I, I took conflict training. What's my next step? I'm gonna tell him, why it's important to me that he turn the socks right side out. Honey, it literally takes me twice as long to fold the laundry. And you might remember that when I fell and I triggered that arthritis in my thumbs, it's actually kind of painful for me to turn the socks right side out. I thought that's gonna get them, right? And so I really would appreciate it if you would take the moment to turn your socks right side out from now on. So of course he says, of course, honey, I'm so sorry, I forgot about your hands. No, he says, I'm sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> what? <laughs> now, my position is, you need to do this. I've given you very good reasons, and I could very easily say, if you don't do this, I'm going on strike. Now, I'm still worried, that means I'm gonna have to pick up some of the cooking, so I really don't wanna go there. But I'm like, what am, you know, what, what am I gonna do now? I've already told him what my interests are. But what I haven't done yet is asked him, why? Like, why, why are you saying no to me? So, Honey, why? Why is it so important to you to put your socks in the hamper inside out every single time? He says, well, here's the thing. My socks are really smelly. And if I, you know, the only way that I can get them off without, you know, sullying my hands is I need to peel them off and put them in the hamper. And the last thing that I want to do is have to turn them right side out. And I'm like, this is gonna go nowhere. But see, but this is why I've been married to him for 30 years. This is what he says. But you know what? I would have no problem turning clean socks right side out. I just don't wanna turn dirty socks right side out. So if you'll just wash the socks and pair them inside out, when I go to put them away, I'll turn them the right way. Score. Score. Again, this is why we've been married for 30 years. 
So you can see what our positions were. Fix this. No, I won't. But then when we started to talk about what our actual interests were in that, we were able to come up with a solution that actually worked for both of us. Now, it's hard for me not to turn them right side out. <laughs> I don't feel complete. But, you know, but at that point, it's on me. Um, but that, that, that was just a little yeah, personal example of, 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 it, of, of position versus interest. And, um, and we were able to figure it out. Oh, look at that. And you're about to celebrate 30 years. And so we're about to celebrate 30 years. <laughs> So one of the other things I want you to hear about Carolyn's story is, <clears throat> so Carolyn's trying to solve what is a fairly small conflict between she and someone that she knows very, very well for 30 years, right? And that was a little bit hard. She had to think about it. She had to really sort of get herself together and say, am I going to address the sock issue in the room or not, right? So one of the other pieces to sort of positions interests and, and whether you engage in conflict has to do with um, something that's called sort of psychological safety, right? So Carolyn knows going in that either this is going to work out for the sock situation or it's not. But they're probably not going to break up over the inside out socks, right? Or she has a pretty good idea of where, there are, where they are. Here's the challenge with those of us sort of in, in this sort of public service realm. You actually don't know what's on the other side. I think, uh, I feel like you said that. Uh, is it Sean? Strong, um, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with sort of unions, you don't know what cards they hold. You don't know when someone walks up to the mic in a school committee meeting, you don't know what they're going to say. So this is really hard. We don't have that psychological safety. We don't have that knowledge that on the other side, you know, it's going to be okay because we're going to get through this. So that's something for you to keep in mind is building those relationships to have those kinds of open conversations is, is really one of the arguably most hardest parts of all of this, right? So when you think about sort of the effort it takes to approach a loved one about something sort of as small as that, um, in my house it's making the bed, same, same situation, same exact situation, but, but you have that psychological safety. So think about that, how important that is to you, that you know that the other person's gonna respect you on the other side, but also think about how important it is to everyone else, so. We're gonna get back to the kinds of conflicts that you, um, have, that you are and that you will be ex experiencing. And um, if I didn't hone in on the school committee superintendent relationship um, as part of this conversation, I think that Tim would probably have my hide. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important stuff. So um, there are people who have done some really good research about what you can do on the front end to try to avoid the kinds of, um, of, of, uh, of conflict-ridden relationships that some school committees have with their superintendent. And so we're just going to kind of go through these five essential elements. Um, and a lot of it is really about what you can do on the front end, especially if you're about to conduct a new superintendent search. The opportunity on the front end to really engage the community on their, on, you know, to, to get their input on the development of the district's vision and ensuring that either your current or your incoming superintendent is really aligned with that vision. So many conflicts come when there is a misalignment there. So any of the work that you can do on the front end is going to pay off in spades. The second is clearly defined responsibilities. Um, we have some assistance from the General Assembly telling us who, who's responsible for what, um, but when you get into the day-to-day -day -day work, sometimes the lines can feel a little blurred, or sometimes some of us want to blur some of those lines. Um, but the, to whatever extent you can have a working relationship with your superintendent where you are able to clearly define who's responsible for what, um, the better off you're going to be. The next, of course, is mutual respect. And that's something that's earned. That's not something that you can just plan for. But any efforts that you can put into having a mutually respectful relationship is going to pay off um, in the long run. The next is flexibility and collaboration rather than authoritativeness. Sometimes we are clear about our roles and responsibilities, and we can use those as a bludgeon over the other person's head. Um, Any time that we can um, just be open to feedback, um, and, um, and be flexible in our approach, um, usually the better off um, you're going to be. And then the final one is remembering why you're there. <laughs> there are so many different competing issues that you have to focus on, but remembering that your number one job is to prioritize student achievement, and every single thing you do should be in service to that. Every agenda that you set, every conversation that you have should be within the context of student achievement. And the more you can get agreement 
from, from the district administration and the school committee and the community that that is your number one priority, the better off you're going to be. The way I look at these five essential elements of a successful superintendent school board relationship is every single one of these is necessary. You could do a workshop on every single one of them. They are absolutely necessary, but they are insufficient with what I think is the missing puzzle piece. And that is understanding and recognizing that conflict in all of those domains is going to happen and having some group norms about how you handle conflict, especially in public school committee meetings, is really, really important because it will derail the most important conversations if you don't figure out how to de deal with and manage conflict productively. And we take our responsibility as stewards very seriously. And we take our oversight responsibilities very seriously. But sometimes we mix up roles and responsibilities and we forget who is in charge for what. And I think that this can sometimes be the root cause of a lot of problems that school boards, school committees have um, with superintendents. Um, I love this. In hindsight, I believe that our oversight was short-sighted. At least that's my insight. So. All right, Carolyn, thank you so much. All right, so on your tables, there should be a little packet that has a big green check on it because um, if, if there's not that on your table, can you raise your hand and we'll figure that out for you? I, I think you're all set. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a few minutes um, and figure out your own personal conflict management style. The reason this is important is because you need to know where you are before you can figure out where other people are before you can bring everyone together. So, open up the packet. There's some directions on there. I feel confident that you can all read those. I want you to think about your conflict management style in one particular way when you answer the questions. So you can either think about it from your role on the school committee you could think about it uh, you know, in your personal life, but stick with one sort of mindset throughout. That'll help you sort of get a, a, true, a true score. So go right ahead. Um, those of you who are gonna skip ahead and start to score at the end, go ahead and skip ahead. I mean, that's fine, um, but we'll give you a few minutes. Go right ahead. Okay, if you're still tallying, no problem. I'm sorry, it's Saturday math, I get it. Um, but for the rest of you who are sort of moving through, it's interesting to be up here sort of watching your facial gestures as you're like, oh, oh. So I want to reiterate what I said. Every style is appropriate for some situation, right? So it doesn't matter. So you could be a competing style and there are times when that's great. You could be an avoider and that's also great at certain times. The important takeaways that you should get from doing this little personal inventory are one, whatever style you come out is your default, right? So that's what you're most likely, that's how you're most likely to respond in a situation. That doesn't mean that you can't choose to respond in a different way, okay? It just means that's your default. <clears throat> the other important thing you should notice is there's sort of two, two columns there, two scores. One is calm and one is storm. So questions A through O are sort of how you respond in calm. And P through D are how you respond when things start to kind of escalate, right? So then you're kind of in a conflict, okay? <clears throat> so your style may be the same. You may have exactly the same style when things are sort of neutral and calm and when things start to get excited. Or your style may change. My style changes a little bit. I'm a lot more avoidy um, in the storm time, right? But I know that, so I try not to be like that most times. So we're going to go through the styles so you can kind of see where they are. We do have some packets and we'll leave them out, uh, out front. I know you've got a short break after this. You can grab a packet with all the detailed information about the styles. Again, no style is better than the other, so don't, don't freak out about it. <coughs> but here they are. There's competing, collaborating, avoiding, compromising, and accommodating, which is also sometimes called harmonizing. Okay? <coughs> so let's... Oh, this is so clever. Apparently, I just learned how to use the little shoot-in thing on the, on the PowerPoint. Okay, so collaborating. I'm not going to have you call yourselves out right now, but if you are someone who scored high in the collaborating, this is what it looks like. Two heads are better than one. 
right? You're going to solve issues together. You're going to talk through conflict. You're going to focus on mutual gain. And you're looking for sort of a win-win. You're looking for everyone to kind of be satisfied. <clears throat> Collaborating is really helpful when you're trying to kind of leverage your collective strength, the collective IQ. Collaborating is less helpful if you've got time constraints. If you really need to make a decision and move forward, sometimes you don't have time to collaborate, okay? <clears throat> Competing, my way or the highway. You're, one is looking to sort of overpower the other. It's a win or lose. You're gonna kind of duke it out, see who ends up standing. Not a, Carolyn, stop calling people out. <clears throat> That's not nice. No consideration of sort of other points of view. It's my way, I've got the best way, and I'm just gonna keep going until you give in, right? So it's really helpful to be a competing person when you need to take quick action. When there's a decision that needs to be made and someone needs to make it, competing is a great style. Competing is not a great style when you really need some buy-in, when you need some consensus among the group. Having one person make a decision and sort of push forward on their own is not that helpful. Compromising. Let's split the difference. We're gonna meet halfway, right? Everyone gives a little, everyone gets a little. No one gets exactly what they want. <clears throat> You're kind of looking for a middle ground there. It's kind of trying to be fair to everyone. It's most helpful when you both want the same thing and maybe it can be divided, right? So, I, you know, I have this eclair, Carolyn and I both want it, we're just gonna cut it in half and call it a day. That's easy, right? It's less helpful when maybe working a little bit longer could lead to a more long-term solution, right? So sometimes compromising is a little bit quick and maybe if you stuck with it a little bit longer, you might get a better solution. <clears throat> Avoiding. People always think that this is the worst one. It's not the worst one, right? It's just another style. You kind of pretend that nothing is wrong. You're either gonna delay or move away from conflict. It has low assertiveness and low cooperation, right? So avoiding is really helpful when someone needs, you just need time to cool down, right? Have you ever been in a conflict and the other person, or maybe yourself, you, are, you just really, you need, a, you need a little time out, right? You need to walk away, you need a drink of water, you, need, you just need a break. So sometimes that's actually really helpful. It's not helpful or less helpful, I guess, when you allow other people to make decisions by default. So you take yourself out and you don't participate and then stuff happens and maybe you're not all that happy with it, right? <clears throat> Last style, accommodating. I don't care that much, have it your way, you're kind of giving in, right? You're letting the other person have their way. Maybe you don't care that much about the outcome. Maybe you're more focused on the concerns of others than yourself. So it's more helpful to be accommodating when maybe you're not right. You know, maybe you have a perspective but you're not really sure that you're right so you're gonna let the other person make a decision. But it's less helpful when maybe there is a better solution and you're just giving in too quickly. Okay. So we're gonna take a moment at our tables and I'd like you to just at your tables kind of share um, as much as you feel comfortable with where your style was. Do you think that's accurate or not? So three things, share what your style is, whether you thought it was, was accurate or not, and then whether you changed from the calm to the storm, okay? So I'm gonna give you about five minutes to do that. Oh, I'm gonna have to use the clapping thing. Oh my God, I'm literally gonna have to do the clapping thing. All right, hold on everyone. If you can hear me, clap once. If you can hear me, clap twice. Oh, thanks so much. That's just my days in youth development. Thank you so much for amusing me. I'm sorry to cut off your very engaging conversation, but I want to make sure that you can sort of get through the, the rest of your day. So, look, here, here's the bottom line about, about this activity, and the reason that we do it almost every time, if you were here last year, you know you did it last year as well, we believe it's really, really important to know where you are. Right? It's really important for you to do a little self-reflection and really get a good sense of where you are in terms of how you look at conflict. Because the next step for you is gonna to be to look at other people and see where they are. So I guarantee you, when you leave today, you're gonna to go home and be like, oh, you're an avoider. Uh-huh, I knew it, right? You're gonna to go to your other school committee members who aren't here and say, oh, too bad you didn't go to the training because I know that you're an accommodator, right? <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I know you're gonna do this. Try to do it kindly, right? But so, so this process is, is really a very thoughtful process. You're gonna reflect on yourself, you're gonna to start to think about where other people are, and then you're gonna to come together. 
right? Because knowing where you are and knowing where other people are leads to better communication and better results, right? It's just, that's just the way it is. So <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with one last slide here. So I, I, oh, oh, no, I'm not. Look at that. I, I pressed too many things. There's too many things around. So one of the things that you should know about these styles is that there, there are sort of two pieces to this. There's relationships and there's goals, right? So for those of you who are farther away than me, the goals is the arrow, the vertical arrow. The horizontal is the relationships. And all of the styles fit in there. So over near that have really high importance on goals are competing, competition, and collaboration. The goal is really important. Avoidance and accommodation are low on goals. Accommodation, high on relationships. And right in the center, as you would expect, is compromise. Right? So again, every style has its place. Don't go out of here saying, oh, I'm a computer. She said that was terrible. I didn't say that. I might be thinking that, but I did not say it. <laughs> but I did not say it. What I said was every style has its place. And you should feel confident about using the right style in the right place, okay? You know, I just quickly want to interject that when I was chair of the school committee in East Greenwich, I, I wish I had had this information, this self-reflection, because I found that my, my primary style in calm situations was collaborative. I was collaborative, some, would, some of my colleagues would say to a fault, because sometimes we did have to make fast decisions and I was always looking for community input. Mostly that served me very well. But when things got stormy for me, I, in retrospect now, went very quickly to accommodating. And that blew back at me multiple times, and I didn't know why. I felt so competent at the front end of, of a conflict and then got a little bit lost um, when I was in the middle of it, unclear about what to do, because my style shifted from collaborating to accommodating. So really, having this knowledge is power, and it really speaks to what style is going to work best based on what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So I just wanted to share that. Thanks, Carolyn. That's super helpful. All right, so we're going to sort of quickly go through a little bit of communication things. So there are some, there's some language that you can use to increase communication, right? So here's some language that you can use that doesn't in increase communication. You're wrong, right? I'm right. Stop talking. Shut up. I mean, you know, I mean, these are things that shut down communication, right? There are phrases that can help you increase communication and open it up. No wonder you're feeling frustrated. Please tell me what happened. Let me write this down so I've got it right. Do you guys ever do that just to like slow the pace down? You like start to handwrite things or type things? It, it just makes everyone stop because they're like, oh, okay, you're doing something. I'm sure we can find a solution. Let me see if I understand you clearly. Thank you so much. I hear what you're saying, right? Now, again, you have to say these phrases and mean them, right? <laughs> tone, tone of voice is very important. You know, it's that, what, what is that phrase if you're from, the, uh, bless your heart, you know how people in the South use that and they, they don't mean it in a nice way? Yeah. So, you know, your tone matters, your sincerity, your genuineness matters, but in general, these are some phrases that you can use that, that help people feel as though you're trying to work with them, right? And that's really important for us. All right, so the next thing we're going to do, Carolyn, I'm going to send it over to you with some quick tips. Sure, yeah, no, they're, you know, they're up there on the screen, and again, these are just, these are things that, um, a little bit of overlap from the, the, the prior slide, but just this idea, take a breath. I can't tell you how many times I've thought to myself uh, with co colleagues on school committee, please, could you read the room? Read the room. Like, we <laughs> uh, good, good reminder for ourselves, listening for understanding. I love the writing things down just to slow the pace. If you're meeting one-on-one -on -one with somebody and the conversation's getting heated, I learned from the chief of police in East Greenwich, offer somebody a glass of water. Just the, 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 the physical gulping helps to kind of calm things down a little bit. Um, asking clarifying questions, open-ended questions, summarizing, clarifying next steps. I found that the most important thing that I could ever say to anybody who came to me with a problem, not that I was going to be the one who needed to fix it, because newsflash, you're not always the fixers, right? But you know what the process is to try to get concerns addressed. So, um, so I would, um, actually I just lost my train of thought there. Um, <laughs> so you're not, you're not always the fixer, but I'm on it. I used to say that to my superintendent. Just tell them you're on it. All people want to know is that what they're concerned about concerns you too. I'm on it, but you got to mean it. Yeah, right, you got to be gotta genuine. Be. <laughs> All right. So just some quick tips. And this is a, this is a final tip that I, I really love, and I think it's specifically apropos to community mediation. Um, and to community conflicts.
because we do have a way of personalizing problems and personalizing conflicts. The problem is with the person. They have you know, a wacky point of view on something and I really disagree with it. The more that we can in our own, in the way we comport ourselves, in the way that we work with other people, recognize that the problem is the problem. It's not the people that are the problem. And sometimes the best way to tamp down a conflict is to get people to shift from fro focusing on the people that are involved and get everybody looking at the problem. Because when it's conflict between people, they're looking at each other. When the, when, when, when the conflict is the problem, you've got two people looking at the problem together. And just that shift in mental mindset can be a huge shift. But we did want to leave you with um, some uh, potential next steps and resources. So um, as we said, we're with the, the Center for Mediation and Collaboration of Rhode Island. Tricia is the executive director there. Um, I'm a volunteer mediator with the center. Um, I also do workplace mediations through the center and I serve on the board. But just to give you a sense of the resources that are available from the center, should they ever be useful to you within your communities. We wanted you to know the kinds of things that we do. So we do host community workshops, um, something similar like this. This is obviously tailored for school committee members. Um, but community workshops um, around conflict resolution is uh, something that we can do. Uh, we do professional development. So within the school district, those are, those, that's a possibility for you as well. We do offer a basic mediation training that any single person in this room would be welcome to take. Uh, we can give you some information about that. Um, just having the skills, even if you don't plan to become a practicing mediator, um, can be super useful. Um, we can do leadership retreats, customized training. Uh, we actually do work in schools. This is, I, I've always felt like the center was kind of this, this well-kept secret in the state of Rhode Island. But we actually work in schools to create peer mediation programs so that we can share um, this kind of information with, um, with middle school students and high school students so that they can get better at conflict resolution themselves and actually create peer mediation programs to help resolve conflicts between youth. So that's something else that we do. And then of course we do mediation services. So whether it's a workplace mediation within the school district, whether it's a mediation that might be necessary between school committee members, um, we're in the mediation business and so those resources are available to you. And then for those of you that are just interested in learning more on your own um, about um, mediation uh, and, and conflict resolution skills, uh, we do have these next steps and resources. We'll be sure that Tim has um, copies of these um, and information about the center in case you want to get some more. Um, but uh, these are all great resources if you're interested in learning a little bit more about the theory behind conflict as well as some strategies for figuring out how to address it. And I think, does that bring us to the I end? I think that brings us to the end. Thank you so much for your attention today. We really appreciate it. Um, and I, you know, obviously School Committee 101 um, is, is a program that works to cap capture people just at the moment when they've joined so that they can have the information and the tools that they need to move forward. But I love the idea, and this would you know, potentially be very community by community, although I could see somebody taking the lead statewide, some kind of an orientation for prospective candidates to help them to understand better what it is that they would be getting into. And I think there's probably lots of folks who might be interested in creating that kind of a program. I'm not sure it's something that the Center for Mediation would lead, um, but, but I think that there's absolutely a need for people to have a better sense of what they're getting into um, on, on all levels. And so whether that happens through local you know, political um, committees or communities or to create forums that would allow community members to come and learn about what's, what it takes um, to be able to serve. Um, I love that idea. I think that's great. And as I said, the center is so happy to be a resource in that if we can support your work. Does anybody else have any other final thoughts or questions for us before we break? All right, well, thank you again so much for having us. Thank and thank, thank you, you again for your service and all the best. You know, there's one for each of you. There's some descriptions of the styles.